Good evening, everyone. My name is Carver. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Cultivating Compliance, Building Trust Through Education by Dr. Crystal Brimer, hosted by Dr. Barry Iden. A recording of this webinar will be sent out in the next week to all registrants. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Please enter your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we will have some time to discuss them at the end. And now, our host, Dr. Barry Iden. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, once again join you. Uh, I hope many of you uh, joined us for the last two evenings in our, uh, in our talks and webinars, they were really fantastic. And uh, I welcome you all again this evening. Can we have the next slide, please? Great. So if you all remember, those of you who were with us uh, on Tuesday evening, we had a fantastic talk by Dr. Art Epstein, who talked about simplifying his approach to the diagnosis and management of dry eye. And then last night, Dr. Paul Carpecki took the dues report, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages long and just boiled it right down to what's really important and showed us how we can apply technology in terms of the diagnosis and management of dry eye. Tonight's a little bit different. It's a little bit more mellow. It's a little bit more relaxed. We're gonna have a good time. Uh, we have the uh, phenomenal Dr. Crystal Brimer here tonight and both of us have a lovely glass of wine and we hope that each of you out there have at least your libation of first choice with you. For me, uh, I selected a 2015 Rioja from Spain. And uh, Dr. Brimer, what, what did you select this evening? I went with the Old Faithful. It's Mayomi. Mayo, you can't go wrong. Old you body can't people. go wrong. I feel Absolutely. like we should do a virtual cheer. A cheers, Barry. I think there we, we could go. Dink. glasses almost. If we went left, ching, ching. right, we Absolutely. should have rehearsed. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, I want to thank Oculus for um, sponsoring these webinars. They've just been fantastic, and um, I hope all of you have enjoyed it as well. Can we have the next slide, please? I also wanted to mention some of the podcasts that Oculus is also sponsoring called May I Interrupt. Uh, May I Interrupt is really a fun uh, time. And basically what happens there is that uh, we have a couple of hosts who are pretty funny. And I didn't realize that they were that uh, humorous at the time that I was involved in doing it. And Jason Jedlica and Craig Norman serve as the moderators and hosts of May I Interrupt. And last week we had one that was devoted to social media and to uh, enjoying whiskey which specifically Scotch whiskey, and that was with Dr. Uh, Alan Glazer and Tom Arnold last week. And I think it's gonna be uh, coming on online uh, sometime this week, if it hasn't already. I did one uh, with Dr. Stephanie Wu, and it was on the topic of uh, complex contact lens management and irregular corneas with the overriding uh, theme of wine, which is obviously mm -hmm. something we all enjoy. So. Uh, go ahead and check those out. They're fun, they're interactive, and uh, to some degree informative, uh, especially towards the beginning before we had two or three glasses. So that's that's absolutely wonderful. So let me now um, tell you about tonight's speaker, and she's going to blush because you can see her now, and it's all this lovely stuff I'm going to say about her. So Dr. Crystal Brimer is a graduate of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and received her optometry degree from Southern College of Optometry in 2000. Now, I contend that anybody who graduated from optometry school in a year that starts with a two is a young and upcoming new mm -hmm. OD. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, uh, Crystal has over 20 years of clinical experience and surely brings a lot to the table. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and she owns a specialty dry eye clinic in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is dedicated tr to treating dry eye in unique ways. As it relates to dry eye and ocular surface disease, she was one of the co-creators of the Vision Source Dry Eye Protocol, and she was involved in designing the Oculus 5M dry eye software platform, as well as the creation of this unique name, the Crystal Report. So now when you see the Crystal Report, you will see this beautiful face in your mind at all times. So 
by the way, as a testament to her entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, she went on to establish the Dry Eye Institute. Here she hosts doctors from across the country for small hands-on interactive ocular surface disease focused uh, retreats. Crystal and I first met a few years ago when we both had the pleasure of visiting the Oculus headquarters, uh, which is located in Wetzel, Germany. She, myself, along with Art Epstein, spent extensive time with the Oculus team there. Um, we shared our US perspective on their various technologies. And uh, it was just amazing to, to meet the people, to see where all this fantastic technology is, is actually being manufactured. In addition to, some drink, to drinking some amazing German beer, which we surely did there, I had the great, uh, a great time by visiting the Leica camera uh, factory and the Leica uh, Museum, Camera Photography Museum, which was just down the road. So anybody who knows anything about uh, cameras knows that Leica is kind of like the, um, the Rolls Royce of cameras. And that was really, really exciting experience. Since then, Crystal and I have interacted at various professional meetings. We've served on uh, consulting groups together. And honestly, uh, she's just an amazing individual. So tonight, it's truly my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Crystal Breimer. And yeah. here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. That's uh, way more than I expected. You did say you would embellish a little, and I, 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 did. <laughs> I didn't know how far. I didn't know how much you had to drink before this. But first of all, it seems like all your webinars do center around some sort of alcoholic beverage. So maybe we should talk about that later. But um, okay. as for the the, the uh, Germany trip, I know that that one little. Uh, that one little day trip to the camera store cost uh, a whole lot more than probably yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the camera right behind me actually oh. in this room it's sitting there yeah so um i don't know about you but i have gotten so many invites to webinars i, I mean for the first week that i was at home every night i was doing a webinar and i've i've gone from extremes to rearranging my stay home schedule <laughs> to registering for something I thought was really important to me and then forgetting all about it. So that's why, you know, I wanted us tonight just to relax and um, lighten things up a little bit. And I, I, I want to say thank you to the industry because they have put forth all these efforts to, to bring us reassurance via webinars and information and, and education. And I think that that's something that's probably going to be here to stay. You know, I, I don't know what the big meetings will look like and if they'll change, but I think we'll have a lot more presence with webinars. And ultimately, you know, that's one of the silver linings. And I just I just want to stop for a second and, and forgive me ahead of time, but say that there are silver linings to this. And I know that some of us have been a little bit just consumed and by fear and anxiety and worry over the unknown, but this is going to end. And in a, in a short time, it's going to feel like it's it was a, a distant memory, and the world's going to be spending twice as fast as it as it was before. And um, I, I think for me, I want to come out of it better than I went in. And I really just I, I want to be uh, be purposeful. And so my challenge to you is this: you know, prioritize and realize that time is a beautiful gift. And right now, you've got perhaps more than you usually do. And so rejuvenate and if you've already done that if you've been laying around a lot then stop it <laughs> and really yeah. look at the practice and think about what can you do to, to um, alleviate the things that made you so frustrated on a day-to-day -day basis get to the root of those logistics and fix it and really think about how to raise the bar and how to improve the patient experience and one way that i would say to do that is truly through patient education um, it changed everything for me. It, it's always been a foundation for my practice, but the more that I, I was driven towards it and uh, emphasized it, the more it changed the patients. You know, patients that would be difficult patients really aren't because they can see the genuine spirit because of the, the time and effort I put into making sure they understand. Yeah, that's great. So Crystal, talking about your practice, it, it is quite unique. So why don't you kind of give us a little introduction about your practice and how you got it all started? I, I, was it your goal coming out of optometry school to establish a dry eye specialty practice, or did this come from some other revelation? Well, as you uh, 
disclosed, Barry, it was 2000. <laughs> so you didn't tell me you were going to do that. But uh, no, I mean, back then, I don't know that it was anybody's mission, except for maybe Donald Corbs, to, to really grow and um, focus on dry eye. So even when I opened this practice in 2015, it was my third practice or, or third location ultimately, but at the time it was my only one. Opened in 2015, had no intentions of it being only dry eye, but it was um, one of my focuses. And the reality is a cascade of events occurred that just, it, it couldn't be stopped. It happened on its own and it overtook my practice. Wow, that's amazing, amazing. Um, why don't you tell us kind of um, what your practice is about at this stage in the game and kind of how you run things there? Well, maybe the best way to say is is a little bit better look at how I got where I am as far as Good. the evolution of the practice. And ultimately, the growth and both in, in revenue and in referrals and um, just reputation, it came from the outcomes. And the outcomes came from compliance. You could have the best treatment of the world, but if they're not going to do it, you've got nothing. And that compliance came from the patient education. And quite honestly, mm -hmm. the 5M has been such a cornerstone of my practice for so long and, and before other people, because I had so many beta versions and it, it was my tool. And the more, the deeper we got, the more I realized what a gift it was to be able to kind of tie a, a nice little bow on this package and be able to paint a picture for the patient and, and help them understand why it is we want to do what we want to do. So if, if one of our attendees is really thinking about this, they, they've thought about dry eye, they've dabbled in it maybe a little bit, um, but they're, they're ready to make that jump. They're ready to make that commitment, which you obviously did. Uh, give them some idea how they can just get this thing off the ground. In one word, <laughs> if you were tying me down to it, in one word, I would say screening. It is absolutely critical. It cannot be overlooked. It, it can't be minimized. It needs to be step number one. It, um, and not just any old screening. It's really important because you've got to think about the patient perspective. So one, it has to be an absolute rule where everybody in the office knows this is what we do and we do it because it's important. But two, it's got to, it, 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 success is based on the patient perception. So if you kind of imagine two different scenarios with me and number one, uh, the patient gets a questionnaire and questionnaires are great. If you're doing them, I absolutely applaud you because there's been so many rooms that I've been in front of where I say, all right, raise your hand if you're doing any kind of screening and it's crickets. It's just not happening. So if you're doing a speed or you're doing a, an OSDI, that's fabulous. You're ahead of the majority. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way would be through objective findings. And the difference is this, I don't want to, to have findings and, and look whether it's a slit lamp or with a camera and, and say, oh, this, this, we, need work, we need work on this, we need to improve this, and I'm gonna need you to do A, B, and C. And then the patient say, nah, it's not that bad. And the reason they do that is because they believe that my findings were based on their symptoms. And even if they do agree to it, then they get home and they say, eh, it's not that bad. Or worse yet, they feel a little bit of improvement and then they stop everything. And it's because I believe that they, they felt like it was all based on their symptoms instead of the findings. So picture this from the patient's perspective and think about the two different scenarios. Questionnaire, patient thinks it's symptoms versus this. And with this one, we do a, a quick screening, it's tear meniscus height, non-invasive keratograph breakup time, and redness. And so in my mind, the way I'm processing this and interpreting it, I'm thinking it's a snapshot of water, oil, and inflammation. And that's the information I'm getting from it. Um, this takes two minutes from the time they put their chin in the headrest, chin in the chin rest, forehead against the headrest, um, until the time that the, the piece of paper is printing out, two minutes. Now, if you said, look, we've got you know, 50 patients a day, we can't give up two minutes, we're already doing all these other screenings, then you could change the non-invasive breakup time 
to interferometry. And it would still give you that picture of oil. And that's a very important for you to be able to show the patient. I like using the nick butt because it correlates it to vision. And I'm able to say, now you see these mires, these rings, they're in the bowl, they're not on your eye, but they're reflected onto the tear film. And as they start to get distorted, this is happening because your tear film's breaking up. And that's the same thing that's happening when you're looking out. The vision's getting distorted and you're having to blink to see better. So I like using that one, but if you're in a time crunch, interferometry, because you can still show that rainbow in the tear film. And you'll be going over this as we go I will. forward. So. Okay. Um, so think about it, take it one step further, and let's say that, heaven forbid, your patient has to wait on you in the exam room. That didn't happen to you, right, Barry? Ever? Oh, yeah, they never wait. They never wait. But let's yeah. imagine, let's imagine you, you did it on purpose, and they had one or two minutes in there waiting for you to, to bust through the door, and you walk in, and they're reading this. Now, and by the way, it's the crystal tear report, not the crystal report. That, that sounds very vain. <laughs> It was going to hey. be crystal clear, but then uh -huh. they were worried about uh, infringement rights and things, so they said crystal tears. It's like, okay. Well, um, it could have been the primer tear report also, by the way. That makes no <laughs> sense. We're trying okay. to make crystal clear tears. <laughs> okay. Come on, Barry. All right. You know, it's all about cleaning up the tear film. So yeah. all good. So the, you walk into the exam room, the patient's been reading this, and on your screen are those three pictures. And the patient is now asking you, they're saying, Doc, what's up? Why is this all orange? Why is, why is it red? What does this mean? And in any given scenario, it's always better when the patient's asking you, not the other way around. Because that's what I think is the biggest beauty and gift of the 5M is that it keeps me from ever being a salesperson. I'm just, I'm just a reporter. I'm just giving you the facts and then we make our decisions together. So you walk in, they're reading this, they ask you what's up, you're looking at the screen, and then you carry it to the slit lamp and you go one step further. And just think about, you know, what would that do to the patient's perception? What, what would it do to their buy-in? Yeah, that's fantastic. So you actually use the keratograph as a screening tool, as well as diving deeper, which I assume we'll be getting into over the next couple of moments once you see something that needs more attention. It's interesting, there's so many different ways, uh, and, and we should acknowledge this, the different ways that practitioners can do it. Just like you mentioned there, there are the questionnaires, and actually at our practice, that's kind of a little bit more of the, the approach that we take that we end up using. We use a DEQ5, it doesn't really matter, speed or OSDI we get uh, a value that we consider either borderline or abnormal. For us, the next screening tool at our practice is osmolarity. And we run osmolarity, and if they're osmolarity and then we look under the slit lamp, seems abnormal, then as I think you do, you will then have patients back for a more extensive dry eye evaluation. Is that true? Do you have them back to dive deeper? I absolutely do. but. Barry, let me challenge you on this. So knowing what that. you do, <laughs> I want you to I want you to go home and just give it, what if you gave it one month and you said, hey guys, we're gonna try this out and it'll be a little internal study. And instead of doing this, we're gonna do these three tests on everybody. And the reason that I say this, and I, I was letting you off easy on the one month, <laughs> but I had um I had a dry eye institute attendee that left and, and I emailed everybody and said, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How are things going? And I got an email back from him specifically that said, Crystal, in three months since I've been gone, we've done over 100 dry eye valves. We are on track to gross $285,000 more than what we were last year, just with what we did differently. And I said, by all means, tell me. <laughs> and he said, we did one thing differently. We started using our 5M and we made a rule that we will screen every single patient. And what That's it does fantastic. is it creates accountability. So do that for a month and then let us know how it goes. <laughs> I will. And, so when, and I, when I bring them back. I'll, I'll have to buy you a case of wine if those numbers start uh, changing I that way. I good stuff, Barry. I'll only, I only have the good stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I bought mine at Tara's Teeter, but that's go. fine. <laughs> um, All good. I bring them back. And I basically apply this if-then scenario. I wanna know what's the underlying cause. 
And anybody who's ever heard me talk has, has, has heard this, but I believe in it because it gives me outcomes 95% of the time. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal. It makes it where I don't dread seeing their name on the schedule. I know we can tackle this and I know we can get results. And basically I walk in on day one and I say, today's different. We're gonna get to the bottom of this. Um, yeah, I wanna know your symptoms, but I wanna know what's causing it. Is there enough water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, something systemic, something environmental? We're gonna do tests in every category. Whatever's positive, we're gonna pair it with a treatment that I know works, because I've seen it over and over again. And every time you come back, I look at it again. Whatever categories we're winning, we back off. And whatever categories we're not winning, we go up a level of aggression. And the only caveat is that we might have to treat multiple things at once, because otherwise it's gonna be a Band-Aid, just like it was with everything else you tried. And so I kind of set the stage there, and then it's important that I'm showing them each category to some degree enough for them to understand why I'm asking them to do each treatment. So with that, you know, we think about these categories and using just the 5M specifically, because the reason I say that is that's my only diagnostic piece of equipment other than osmolarity and, and vital dyes and things like that. Um, but with uh, aqueous deficiency, we can see it with tear meniscus height and also lid wiper epitheliopathy if we put in the lysamine green. Uh, as far as meibomian gland disease, you can see it everywhere. And I think that's really important. When a patient only sees mybography, it, it's not really relevant to them. It doesn't mean anything, even though it means a lot to us. But when we can show them four or five pieces of data that were easy to collect and they all point to the same diagnosis, now they wanna do something to treat it. Allergy, I'm looking at you know uh, mucus strands in the tear film, I'm looking at papillae, uh, inflammation, again, this is one that you can see with multiple tests, even if just a, a redness score or lid appearance, you're gonna see it be able to show them. Bacteria, lid appearance is gonna tell the story, and then really going into the function of the blink, which is is critical, and I, I think this part is, is something that's overlooked in a lot of um, mainstream practices when they're trying to treat, treat dry eye. And that's unfortunate, because that's when you can do a whole lot of stuff and not get better, because there's poor closure at night or they're not blinking well throughout the day. You know, but, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on that one and just put an emphasis. If I had a bell, I would go ding, but I'll just drink. There we go. And that is so important to be able to make those differential diagnoses. At our practice, we have an associate who's an oculoplastic surgeon, and she bangs us over the head about all the things we miss. And she's teaching us so much over time in terms of anatomy and all of those factors and conjunctival chalasis and, and millions of other things. Yes. Um, they may not be the most commonly experienced, but if you miss them, you're going to be treating things with not getting the results. So you're spot on with that. Absolutely. You're going to be treading water. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And these are just the categories. And, and to look at it, you may say, oh my gosh, that's, that's too many. Other people only use three or this and that. But the reality is, when I do my slit lamp exam, these are just red flags that are going off in my head as soon as I see it. I'm looking at the lid margin and I automatically know, how's the gland function? Is there inflammation? Is there rosacea? You know, you're looking at the tear film. This is not hard. It's just, um, it's, it's just a matter of thinking it through the first few times to say, what is this? Structurally, what is it telling me functionally? Um, and then knowing what treatments to pair with it. Yeah, and you know what's amazing to be, to be honest, and that is the fact that by doing this, we change the whole conversation with patients, don't we? I mean, if you think about it, most patients, they think dry eye, doctor's gonna give me what? Artificial tears. Maybe now they're thinking there'll be a prescription drop because they get commercials bombarding them all the time. But what you're doing here, and I, I'd like to say that we tend to do similar, we may approach it a little differently, but pretty much we tell patients, yes, you have dry eye, but our goal is to figure out why you have dry eye. And there's so many reasons why you might have dry eye and the way we manage it and their success rates are so much higher if we figure out really what the major offending elements are. So if you could take us through that sort of experience, uh, and walk us through some examples along the way, that would be absolutely awesome. Yes, and I will, as long as you promise, mm. think about this from the patient's perspective. So kind of take off your doctor hat and put your patient hat on, who comes in with just what you said. I'm expecting tears, 
uh, maybe a prescription drug. And then I'm also expecting that if I get that prescription, it's going to be cheap, right. <laughs> covered by my insurance, and it's going to work. And it's the only thing I'm going to need to do. And that I won't have to do it for long. So we're facing that mentality every day. And if we want to get results, we know it takes more than that, but it takes that motivation from the patient. So where do I start? This is my mini dry eye valve. And this is where I would recommend for you to start if you already have a 5M. Um, and the reason is it gives me all of those categories, a yes or no. It gives me multiple data points for several of the categories. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a few minutes. But the other benefit of it is it takes six minutes. I've timed this multiple times. And from the time they put their chin in there to the time that you're ready to uh, wrap it up, six minutes. And if you're, if you're bringing them back for a dry eye eval, you need it to be somewhat substantial, you know, but you don't want the acquisition to take all the time. You want to be able to spend that time on patient education. But a lot of times, you know, doctors are charging an out-of-pocket dry eye eval fee. So it's, it's important that we do something differently on this visit. So to kind of walk you through those eight tests, we start with tear meniscus type. What's this going to tell us? It's going to tell us about their water level. Now, granted, the oil is also in there, but this is what we've always used along with red thread tests and Shermer to kind of point to aqueous deficiency. And keep in mind, don't just call it abnormal when it's too small. Think about your, your patients who have epiphora, you know, who are over tearing and don't understand why they're over tearing. They have, uh, they will not agree with you that they're dry until you show them more evidence. But this is number one, it takes just a second to acquire. And then my, my second go-to, and this is one of my favorite tests, is interferometry. Now this one, you're gonna notice no color almost right now, but stay tuned. I said, guy, you're, you're halfway blinking. I need a good blink. Look at the color that comes out when that happens. I love this video and I actually got it yesterday, <laughs> but watch it again. So no color hardly. And then, and we've been talking for a long time about his partial blinks. Then he blinks well, much better. And look at the color that comes in. You're pumping the oil, baby. Isn't that great? Yeah, and at least this was been enough where he could do it. But this is a, a point that I make on a lot of my follow-ups. I say, listen, you know, I just express those glands and they know they're expecting me to debride and express every single time. And they also expect me to have a conclusion based on it and a treatment recommendation. So if it's too thick coming out, we're gonna talk about supplements. We're gonna talk about treatments and procedures that will thin the oil. If it's thin, but it's clogged, we're gonna talk about those treatments and procedures. But if it's good quality and it's flowing, but yet I'm not seeing it on interferometry, we're gonna slow that down and look at their blink function and see why it is. Now here's one who has much better flow and just consistent oil. Look at that rainbow, it's nice, right? <laughs> and basically the way that I explain this to the patient is, there should be a rainbow prism in there. Like when it rains outside on a greasy spot and you can see the oil in the water, that's what we're seeing here. And I wanna see that rainbow. If that rainbow is not happening, it's because the oil's not getting into the tear foam. And it's either because it's clogged up, the glands are dead, or you're not blinking fully. And then we go on further to research what the, the, the real cause is. Here, uh, Crystal, I love, could I, could I, could I yeah. jump in for just a second? Because I have a question maybe some of the audience are thinking about or the attendees are thinking about. When you have these videos captured, how long of a period of time? Do you have a standard amount of time uh, that, you, that you're that you having them blink? Um, I mean, you know, because we have our, our doctors don't do any of these tests. And I know at some practices you're having all your texts like we do and other practices, the doctor is actually doing it. Uh, obviously, if the doctor's doing it, you're diagnosing as you're watching it. But if you're having a tech do it, what would you recommend? My recommendation is to teach the tech what you're looking for, because you're going to have to to get good results anyway, because you need her focused on that tear foam. And most of them are going to go automatically and focus on the rings. So when you show her, here's what we're focused on. I need you to, to video this until you prove that you're focused in the right spot. And here's what I mean. Um, if I'm doing it myself, I will move the joystick, have them blink. And when I can see debris floating up in the tear film or color, if there's actually color, then I'm going to press my foot plate or my joystick button and I'm going to start my video. I'm going to ask them to blink at least two times, maybe three, and, and just to prove the point. So in some people, it may be one blink does it, but I don't ever do one because the video might not have started or stopped exactly where you thought, but it doesn't take long. 
you know, two or three blinks max, as long as you're focused in the right spot. Right, excellent. And, excellent, and by the way, let me just add one more thing. Um, I know one of our, te our techs are listening to you right now, they're on, and one of them is Marco. Hi, Marco. So that's when he okay. actually presses or does that sort of thing. So, you know, you gotta work it both ways. My man, Marco. I'm sorry, Marco. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, now in this one, I love doing this, and, and this is one of the ones I do on my follow-up every single time, and I do it because it makes an impact with the patient. And I'll, I'll show you a few different ways. You know, if, if they have migrating makeup or if they're not, we're at the beginning and they're not seeing relief, they're, we're just getting started. I wanna show them how contaminated that tear film is so that later as they come back, I can show them improvements and they may not be feeling great yet, but I can tell them this is where it starts. It all starts here and we clean up the lids and we clean up the tear film and then you're gonna feel it. So look at this progress we've made and it keeps them bought into the plan and it gives them the encouragement they need even though they may not be at the end point they want yet. Could you be a little bit more specific in what you're looking at in the tear film dynamic, please? Can you, you can see my, my cursor, right? Yes, um, we sure right can. Right here, around these, these white dots, you see all the muck flowing around, right? See when, when, when she blinks, everything that's moving? Yes. So that's what I'm, I'm focused on. And then the patient is gonna automatically say, what is it, right? And that is what's gonna be different from patient to patient. And that's a little bit tougher to really pinpoint what is it. So what I do is I start ruling things out. One, does she have a lot of scurf on the lid margin or um, blepharitis or migrating makeup? Cause then it's just external debris that's getting into the tear film. But what if she doesn't have that? You know, it could be um, allergic mucus, especially if I see strands and we've got a staining pattern that's nasal and it's a papillae. Um, but it also could just be inflammatory proteins and muck and not, not having a, uh, a, a nice tear meniscus height and uh, good osmolarity. You know, they, yeah. they could just super hyper osmolar because of the lack of oil and water. So I well, can't sure, always say, here's your yeah, reason, right. but I can expand on this so that they know, all right, we've got a plan. Surely the term muck down in North Carolina is a good one. I'm originally from New York, we call it schmutz, but that's a whole nother story, but go ahead. Not what I meant if I said schmutz. <laughs> I know, but they don't get it, it's a different story. No, they it's might a get up place. a walkout. They probably <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. And then, and Barry, every time you interrupt me, it, it means I get to drink a, a, a drink of wine, so. Good, you start it. talking, I've got, <laughs> got more drinking than this. Um, the bulbar redness test, I, I love this because it's it's so quick, focus and click, and what a great way to show progress as we go. And not only that, but in that first dry eye eval, this always blows them away because they had no idea it was that red. And um, this is very good at highlighting every uh, conjunctival and scleral vessel that's there. And then looking at the lid margin. So this is where I can show them that the glands are, are puckered up, you know, in that bottom left one, you can see the topography of it. And just because in my exam room, I actually have the 5M in there on a Pico stand that lets me have the slit lamp and, and, and uh, 5M together. So it allows me to be able to express and then pull that, that camera over and show them what's coming out, which is always pretty fun, right? right? Fantastic. Fantastic so compelling to the patient when they see that. Yes, it changes everything. Um, and then going on with the lids, I get so much information from this. And you know, I think back to the way this was done 15 years ago, I feel like way too often the majority of doctors and myself included, we were going right past the lids. You know, we were going to the cornea, let's get in there and let's, let's get through the pupil, let's get mm -hmm. to the retina. And we missed the whole story. And so now I spend so much time, every slit lamp exam I do, it is the same exact routine. It's look down. And I'm looking at that top row of lashes and I'm looking for um, bacteria, cholerets, all this. And then I'll say, look straight. And I'm really looking at how thick the lid margins are, how much, how much telangiectasia there, um, what do the glands look like? And then I'm going to the tear film and I'm looking at the contamination and then I'm looking and, and mucus strands and things like that. Then I go to the conjunctiva and I'm looking for calasis and injection. And I do all that before I ever get to the cornea. And when I do that, it tells me the yes or no for all these categories. And it's just an automatic picture in my head of, okay, here's what we've got. Now here's what we're gonna do. 
And it's so um, amazing how common lid margin inflammation is. And, you know, we just kind of like immediately just, as you said, go to the cornea and posterior to that, but it is common. It is common. Yeah. And when you see a patient that looks like any of these patients on this screen, you're not going to get relief for them until you address these lids, you know, until you address this underlying uh, inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. I put that one in the bottom middle. I threw it on there. It's actually a tiny little uh, lash that needs to be epilated. And some of these folks, especially as their, their skin gets less elastic and there's a little bit more entropion or ectropion going on, sometimes you don't see those little things. So I, a lot yeah. of times I debride every one of them and that's when it pops up. So just be on the lookout. It's one more thing regarding the lid that you should look for. Well, and you know, then, last, not, last night, Paul was speaking about that and he showed a great example similar uh, to a patient who's been treated at another practice in all different sorts of dry eye types of treatments, medication, so on and so forth, and ended up having quite a proud little concretion under the lid that was constantly yeah. irritating the surface of the eyes. So people say, oh, you had desiccation staining. It wasn't desiccation staining. So again, a great example that you just brought out. Flip the lid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's hey, like I have a question for you. Know, it's fun you. If now, you, you just look at it the right way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So getting back to inflammation for a moment, obviously, as you look at an eye, it's easy to look and see, boy, that's an inflamed eye. And, you know, you're looking at the lid margins, the conj and all of that sort of thing. But do you do any sorts of quantitative uh, specific in, uh, inflammatory measurement tests? Is that something you believe in or incorporate? I do osmolarity, and as you know, um, with the tear lab device, it, it's not a true inflammatory marker. But also, right. if they're hyperosmolar, it, I feel like it's impossible for them not to have inflammation because Agreed. it's hand in hand. Now, and I also, uh, early on, I did Inflamadry a ton, um, and I, I don't do it every single time now, but I have it and I do utilize it. And I think the key to it uh, that I was missing is to, to really know if it's positive, because sometimes it's a faint, faint pink line, I needed to get my transilluminator under there and see, yeah. because I probably called it negative a lot when you're looking at that eye going, how could this be negative? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I have the exact, we have the same exact experience. When it's positive, no question, it's positive, yeah. right? But when it's negative, doesn't really mean it's negative. Sometimes maybe uh, whoever took the, the sample didn't get enough of the sample in there or it didn't show. And, and again, last night, the audience who was there last night with us was uh, privy to some very new information because uh, according to Paul Carpecki, yesterday the FDA just approved Tier Labs' uh, new discovery okay. system for uh, MMP9 quantification, which is something we've been waiting for a long time. So I'm real excited about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a, a game changer. And I think it will open up a lot of folks to bringing Tier Lab in, whereas before they felt like um, they didn't know what to do with it necessarily. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so going back to the makeup specifically, because I imagine, Barry, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. It must be pretty tough to have this conversation with a woman <laughs> when well, excuse me that there could be some I've feelings been a, I've been accused there. of being metro by a lot of people so you know I'm all over that <laughs> all right so you you just call her girl don't do that <laughs> yeah, that's right but go ahead but my point is even I am not going to criticize a woman's makeup or how she applies it without showing her because I want this to be neutral territory where there is no judgment. And I basically let her come to the conclusion of, oh my gosh, because this is disturbing. And I never show this to a woman where she doesn't later come back and say, all right, what's it look like? How am I doing? <laughs> so it creates behavioral change. And then of course, looking for uh, regular old blepharitis and cholerets. I, I don't consider these cholerets. This was actually a 12 year old girl, shocking. And then really love to, to do my fluorescein video. This is one of the, the most valuable things to me because I see so much. I can show them conjunctival cholesis. I can show them blink function. And I could show them corneal and conjunctival staining. Um, and I always do this with the purpose of slowing it down and looking at their blink. So when I do it, I am tell a little fib. Um, I, I start my video and I say, listen, I'm just getting ready. You go ahead and blink as you need to. 
and I'll make sure they get five or six blinks in. And then I say, okay, now hold it open as long as you can. I wait for the tear film to break up and then I let them blink a few times. And that way I've got two different sessions of blinks where I can slow down that video replay and I can show them that they're closing or not closing appropriately. Yeah. And if, if they break up quickly, it's just such a beautiful story that ties in with the interferometry and the mybography and everything else regarding their diagnosis. Do you Could use I, that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm looking at some questions coming in from the audience. By the way, Marco says hello to you. Um, <laughs> hi, Marco. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Okay, now this is practical stuff and we'll continue on with more of the, uh, you know, the medical aspects. but one of the attendees asked, do patients pay for the screening test in your practice? And if so, uh, how do you create the buy-in to pay for that screening? No, they don't. And, and one reason why I made that decision is it takes one minute, one, and two, dry eye is so incredibly common. You know, it's it's ubiquitous. And but a lot of these folks are coming in with early structural changes that don't really have symptoms. So that person's not gonna pay for a screening. And, and I really, uh, you could do it, but I don't, I think that the, the return is much greater. The information is a big enough return versus saying, oh, we're gonna charge you $10 for this or $5 or whatever it is, $20. Yeah, absolutely. I when I have a patient who has structural issues, um, and we're able to justify billing photos, we will bill photos for that mm -hmm. person. We don't do it universally. So it, it comes out even in the end. And not only that, but the people who have issues and who are gonna score poorly, that's the drive to get them back for the dry eye valve. Yes. And using something less might not have done it. So it's worth it to me every day of the week. One quick other question, then you can continue on. Um, one of the attendees was asking, with all of this imaging that you're taking, even during your screening and then ultimately in the more extensive workup, are those images um, saved in the patient's record? When I get to the part where I show you my patient education story, I'm gonna show you a collage image. And one other thing that I love about the 5M is instead of bringing over multiple images, I can take one collage image for the right eye and one for the left. I can even put it together in one picture for both eyes. And in one glance in my EMR, I know what their status was that day. And it's so much more information than I would get from anything else and in a smaller footprint. Fantastic, thank you. And, and the reality is you don't have to take it into your EMR, you know, to be able to bill for it. It can live just oh. in the Liz, as long as you do your interpretation and report. No doubt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So then we get to the, you know, what, what so many of us jump to. Uh, and what I mean by that is at Dry Eye Institute, I've had so many folks show up at the table who already had a lip of view and a lip of flow. And they're there for one reason. They say, we don't have any buy-in. It's been sitting there two years. It's got dust on it. Our people won't pay for that. And my belief is because you're showing them something that doesn't matter to them yet. You know, it's like, I don't know if you'll think this is funny or not, but I do. And as long as I'm having a good time, that's half the battle, right? right. But it's like, like telling them, now listen, that second toe is longer than the first one. You see it right there. It's clearly longer. We're going to have to chop that off. Mm -hmm. We need to make them even. And even though they can see it, there's no clinical relevance to them. Does that make sense? But yeah, but I think in the in the business world, this is well known as the comparison between features and benefits. I mean, you could tell people yeah. all these different facts, but if it doesn't relate to anything in their life uh, and they don't understand it, they get no buy-in. So you're talking about by explaining these things to them, you're teaching them about the benefits that you're going to bring through your therapy. Isn't that correct? For change. And, and that's one of the biggest things is you can see it all over their face. So obviously this is an abnormal mybography, um, but what I really want to show you is this, because this changed everything for me. I used to show them my, my lip of view and lip scan, and I would show them a piece of laminated piece of paper. And I would say, all right, here's what normal looks like. Here's yours. And I just talked and talked and talked. And at some point, you know, I'm waiting for them to look at me and get it. But at some point I thought, who am I trying to sell here? You or me? And it was exhausting. And I think doctors are feeling that 
pretty commonly where they don't want to be a salesperson. I didn't do this to be a salesperson. And that's the biggest thing that is completely transformed for me is I never feel that way anymore. Great. Mm -hmm. Wow. So everything that you're talking about is really creating compliance through education, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, that's and, really and fantastic. To kind of take you from start to finish, because that's kind of where the magic happens, right? <laughs> is when you you tie it all together. And this is that collage picture that I was telling you about. I mm -hmm. use this on every single dry eye eval. And just as a side note, for my follow-ups, I still do tear meniscus height, interferometry, redness, and um, the tear film dynamic, just because I like it. <laughs> so it gives me a snapshot of water, oil, inflammation. And my techs know what to do and, and what to acquire, but that way I've got a collage for that day too. It doesn't have as many pictures, but it helps them know, all right, things are changing, moving in the right direction. I'm gonna stick with this. So you can take this collage as a snapshot and bring that into your EMR. That's exactly what I do. And if you wanted to, to click the little button that says both eyes over here, then you would have smaller pictures, but you could transfer mm -hmm. those over. Fantastic. So now that we've finished our, we finished the acquisition part, I'm going to go back to that patient. I'm going to say, you remember what I told you? We're going to get to the bottom. Is there enough water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, systemic, environmental? Let me show you where we stand. And we start with the upper left and we walk through each one. And I sometimes I'll do it twice. Um, I'll do it once in the small pictures and once in the big so they hear it twice. But here's what I would say in this situation. I would say, now here you can see the water and, and we're a little bit low on water. And then look at this next picture of the lid margin. See how these glands are puckered up like little pimples? And that one's capped off. Now, luckily we don't have a lot of bacteria in there, but the problem is that oil is not getting from the lid margin into the tear film. And we can see that because there's no color in the tear film. There should be a rainbow in here, like when it rains outside on a greasy spot, but it's not happening. And I also know that because the tears are, are breaking up too quickly, they're evaporating because there's not enough oil to keep them on the surface. You can also see all this, this structurally, all this excess tissue here. Now, what's happening long-term because the oil's not coming out is these glands are dying. This is a one-way street. If that oil doesn't come out, it can't go back in. <laughs> and so it's a Southern term, Barry, but- I got it, I got it, y'all. It can't go back in. And so the glands just start drying up. And so what we have to do is get it moving again. Um, and what you do see in the tear foam is all this debris and it's creating this toxic environment. You can see the inflammation in the eye, but you can see it in the lid margin as well. That is so, great walking through that, it paints that picture. And then what I do is I click on one picture and I walk through it one more time. And you saw, I mean, it takes about 60 seconds. Now at that point though, I'll say, now if I'm gonna simplify this for you, our number one issue here is inflammation and oil. And then I might go to a secondary, you know, secondarily we've got a, a little bit of uh, partial blanks and conductival chalasis, whatever it is. But for one and two, Let's talk about our options and what we can do about it. And I'll walk through the good, better, best. And I'll say, okay, we can do supplemental things. You know, we can talk about diet and uh, omega supplements. We can talk about pharmaceuticals or we can do procedures that will help stabilize you. And then I'll say, you know, judging from what I know about you just in this last little bit, I, I feel like you would rather me go in this direction so that we could, let's say that, that I feel like they would wanna do a procedure because they want quick and they've had this for so long. I'll say, now here's an option. We can go to these procedures, you know, we can do an IPL and we can do this series and that may keep us off of pharmaceuticals. Now for somebody else where I know they don't wanna pay the money for the procedure and they would rather just stick with what insurance covers, then I may say, you know, we can start here and if we don't get the relief we need, then we may bump up to a procedure, but I'm giving them options, I'm telling them Here's your story, number one. Number two, here's your top line problems. And then number three, here's what we can do about it. And I'm just showing you what's here and we're gonna decide together. And I make sure that they're included in this so mm -hmm. that they're accountable for the results. And whether we do procedures or we do pharmaceuticals, we are going to do the supplemental part. You know, we're gonna talk about lifestyle and if nothing else, I have learned this so much over and over again in the last year of really turning my practice over into dry eye only, but I've seen case after case how lifestyle affects their ocular outcomes.
And it's just astounding. And, and so basically I've seen these patients that we were doing fabulously and all of a sudden life falls apart and so do their eyes and then the opposite holds true. And so it's really become a big focus in my practice of incorporating that and talking about it. Quit, quit ignoring it, it's a big deal. And the reality is if you can motivate that patient, they're gonna come out with so much more of a win than just eyes that feel better. Their life is gonna feel better. So, so what this has done for me, um, well, there's our crystal tear report. So let me show you that. <laughs> they have the, the pie graph that shows them the stoplight approach of, of what their big issues are. And then each one has the tests that were done to create that score. And then definitions of all the tests and a summary of the treatments that I asked them to do. So this is what they go home with on the dry eye valve. I'm great, well, we're pretty good <laughs> at making sure they all get this. Um, because the tech fills it out. I, I don't care if they accidentally put moderate instead of severe, mild instead of mild, it doesn't matter. This is a tool, mm -hmm. it's a tool for patient education and it's a tool to send back to that referring doctor so that they are confident that we've got this and it just validates their referral. Um, we're really good at that and we're good at printing out the screening report. There's also a follow-up report. We don't do that quite as consistently, but I always show them. But what this has done is exactly what it says on the screen. I never feel like a salesperson. I am a messenger and I'm a partner with them. And because of that, that's what I meant by, I don't dread seeing them on the schedule. We're gonna get there because I know they're bought in. And also I, I don't have a lot of difficult patients anymore, even though they're desperate and they're extreme, they're not difficult because they know my intent and my um, just drive to help them get better. And, and not only that, I'll kind of skip forward, it's differentiation, right? And this, I, I took this picture in the Charlotte airport one day, I was walking by from B to C, and you know, there's that long row of restaurants, and here every restaurant is completely empty, except this is the line for Chick-fil-A. And it wraps around and all the way down here, you can't even get by them, it's touching the rocking chairs. And it was just this beautiful, simulation to me of that's what the five is, is to my practice. It's not just about doing it differently. It's kind of about the integrity that's behind it of saying I care that much to spend five minutes telling you more than, than what you would have known otherwise. And not only has it differentiated the practice, but it's differentiated the way I practice. So not just how they see me, but how I see them and how I approach them. So when we took out the optical, I uh, put in this wall with the fireplace and a bar and there's some red wine maybe and, and uh, lattes. And then on the other side of it, there's these 11 foot shears and this little relaxation room. And I have them, I can't fix this, this stress in your life, but I need you to know that it matters. And what I can do is next time you come 30 minutes early and we will lay you in there and close the, 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 the curtains and we'll put a tranquil vibes mask on you and you just sit there and relax and we've got the music going and then I'll do a warm expression and all that's free. And, and not only that, but you don't have to wait till your appointment to do it. You come anytime you want, you know, between nine and six on Monday and Friday, <laughs> Monday through Fridays. <laughs> and I just, it changed things for me because it, it, it showed them when, when they walk in the door that I care. That is fantastic. I have to be honest with you. So we're getting a bunch of interesting questions coming in since we're getting towards the end of our time. And this has been phenomenal, to be honest with you. Um, and you deserve to have your name on that report because it's that's awesome. Um, so Thank you. Here, here's one from me to you. One of the challenges I find in long term management, short term management isn't that big of a challenge to to me it's the long-term management it, it's human nature when you start feeling better what happens compliance goes down <laughs> what's that you, you stop, stop right exactly so how do you approach i'd love to hear how you're trying to cut that off at the pass they feel guilty <laughs> okay I, I didn't know you were. Me. I didn't know you were Jewish. But they come in and it's like some sort of confession <laughs> session. They're like, uh, I got to tell you, too. I'm not doing my warm compresses every day. You know, I got two in last month, and, and I just need to tell you. And it's it's just it's yeah. great. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it it is challenging, and guilt are another thing. Um, we we have that throughout all the elements of our practice. Thank I don't you. know if it's you know what my mother has done to make me feel. 
get people to feel guilty, but when they come to see me, they always seem to feel guilty. I don't think that I make them feel guilty. They, they're like that when they walk in, and I think it's because they know I care. And mm -hmm. it's like they want to make me proud or something. <laughs> um, yes. But, but they want to know that they're stable in doing what they're doing. And that's what I always tell them. I'll say, listen, that's great. I'm glad you told me. That's okay. It's not about perfection. It's about progress. And guess what? I'm going to take a look at you. And if what you're doing is doing the trick, that's all we'll do. Yeah. So I really try to take the pressure off of them because I do not want them to get overwhelmed and quit. So in the last few minutes that we have left over, let's go through some questions that are coming online, which are really good ones, actually. Here's one. How much time do you block off for a true full dry eye eval? Um, so I think that it's not about the amount of minutes. It's about the time of day. So my advice to you would be make it the last one before lunch and the last one before the end of the day. Um, I, my model is different. I only have 10 patients a day. And so I pour into them, but my average revenue per patient is over $1,500. You know, we, we do very well with a whole lot fewer patients because of, of, just doing it differently. But what I would say is if you normally do a routine exam in 20 minutes, maybe extend that and give it a 30 minute block and do it the last one before lunch, last one before uh, the end of the day. And that way, if you do wanna take more time, you can do it. Because what I found is that if I didn't do it that way, and I, I do it that way to this day, I was distracted because I was mm -hmm. thinking about people out front and then I couldn't do as good of a job. And what I don't want you to get, caught up in is how many minutes did it take for that dry eye eval? Because that dry eye eval is everything. It is, it's the life of the relationship moving forward. It's everything of, of, you know, I look at charts where they may not have been as compliant with their visits, but they've been buying vitamins every month for three years. And it was yeah. because of that one day. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's a couple of others since we have about two or three minutes left that look interesting everything actually looks quite interesting here uh, a lot of shout outs to you that you're doing a great job which i agree a hundred percent so that's good uh somebody was asking about amniotic membranes do they have a role in your dry eye practice and if so when do you find them applicable absolutely and i have changed and evolved in that i i used to think oh it's not bad enough it's not bad enough and then the more um severe cases that started coming in my practice, I realized that if I intervened earlier, they wouldn't get so bad. And so it changed my whole perspective because I started having all these filaments come in and every week they're coming in in so much pain and I'm peeling them off. And then and then we would get better and be coalesce vertical staining and we get better and it would be SPK. So then all of a sudden I start seeing SPK on a couple multiple visits. I'm putting a, a ProCare on them. And, and I do that because I, it works better for me. And I, I felt like there's a, I felt more comfortable with the safety profile in my experience that I've had in trying multiple brands. So we we obviously uh, concentrated on the keratograph, uh, you know, tonight in terms of its dry eye applications. Somebody asked if there are any uh, specific insurance codes that cover some, if not all, of the procedures that you talked about diagnostically on the k I, on the k5 okay i'll bill anterior segment photos and if there's something warranted so if they've got um a lot of spk or they have dystrophy degeneration i'll build topography and um what else that's it with the character but right? you do uh, but i assume you do charge a separate out of pocket yes. fee yes, 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 for yes. the yeah. and, and Barry, also, when they come back for their follow-ups, they're getting tear meniscus heights, interferometry, redness. And the reason I do those three, I do tear film dynamic too, but those three specifically is because I cannot get that information from the slit lamp. And this is a critical point because if, if you talk to the billing gurus, they say, well, you can't just take a picture of something you can see at the slit lamp. You can't just take it to document it. You have to, it has to influence your medical decision making. So the redness score, I can't get a score at the slit lamp. I can't measure my tear meniscus height at the slit lamp and I can't see the oil in the tear film at the slit lamp. So I specifically do those three and I bill anterior segment photos on every one of my follow-ups. So even at 10 patients a day, that's another $200, sure. just FYI. On my dry eye evals, I am not, I'm really billing for the report. 
Um, and what I mean by that is when you think about if you build a 99204 or 99214, you can't just say, well, 25 minutes was that, and then these other minutes were this. I don't think Medicare would like that. Um, and I don't want to get into billing because I'm no expert, but mm -hmm. I, I also don't want to say, well, I'm billing for photos, and this number of photos was to bill, and this number was for a dry eye report. So the dry eye eval, for me in my office, it is called dry eye eval with Oculus 5M keratograph and crystal tear report. And I phrase it that way because there's nothing that overlaps with that, when, with that report. Um, and, and you would inform patients uh, before they're coming in that there will be certain things that are covered under their medical insurance, but unfortunately some elements will not. Is that correct? Absolutely. And we have them sign an ABN beforehand. But we tell them, you know, it's going to be very extensive. You're not going to have ever had anything like this. And as long as they leave believing that was true, we don't have any issues. That's we need fantastic. to explain it well on the front end, but I never have anybody upset on the back end. Yep. Yep. That's really fantastic. So, um, so here, let's let's just end because we we've kind of unfortunately come to the end. We can go on for another hour. We can open up another bottle or two, right? All of those great things. So first of all, let me thank you, Crystal. You did a phenomenal job, not only in terms of the education that you provided, but one thing that is not measurable is your enthusiasm. It's obvious, but it's not measurable. And that is so important to us because we realize when you're passionate, that comes across to your patients and you're gonna just be doing so much of a better job. So thank you. And then I want to thank everybody out there who has attended these dry eye uh, webinars this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, I, I'm sure you you had to learn a lot because how could you not? There was such expertise that we uh, that we brought to you. Uh, and finally, I want to thank Oculus. What an amazing, amazing company! Not only in the technologies that they bring to us but in the support of our professions and understanding that it's all about the patient. So thank you and major shout out to, uh, to Oculus. And with that being said. Can I say one say? more thing? Hold yeah, on, please. hold on. Go, she's um, got one more. I've got one more. Somebody took over my slide. All right, invest in your, in your practice and in your patients. There's so many resources on dry eye. I've got the website up here for Oculus and all the recorded webinars. And this is for, uh, a, not just this week, there is a lot on there. So a ton of resources. Dry Eye Institute is what I have in Wilmington. It's a small retreat of five to eight people or so, and we do everything hands-on. Um, and my contact information is right here if you wanted to reach out and have any questions. But other than that, thank you, Oculus. Thank you, Barry. Thank you all for being here and, and use your time wisely. It is gonna yes. end. <laughs> so Cheers. to everybody out there, stay safe. Stay connected. Cheers. Better days are on the way. Good night. Good night.